winner of your mom's sodomy prize for poetry mostly new poems 2021 to 2022 by matt wall read by the author um and i'll read the um whatever copyright page uh this is the first edition from may 2023 copyright 2021 2022 matt wall and poetic anarchy press press because it a typo www.ihatematwall.com www.poeticanarchy.com Cover painting by Christine Grace This first printing is limited to, limited to 125 signed and numbered copies paid for by a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo that took place March 1st through the 30th, 2023 and then I think it actually went halfway through April as well but whatever acknowledgments some of these poems were published in the f following zines and websites the blotter mad swirl the blood rag i hate matt wall dot com and the i hate matt wall dot com 2021 yearbook I would also like to thank Matthew Buckley Smith for humoring me that this book was a good idea. Dimitri Reyes for encouraging me to do uh, the crowdfunding campaign with mostly new material. Brian Bruce for helping me overestimate the draw of a photo of me on the can. <laughs> Uh, finally, Alice Allen, Ethan McGuire, Chasey Delaney, and Bunny Wild for helping me pick out what poems should go into this book. To see the ones that didn't make the cut, check out my chapbooks, Runner Up and Extra Extra. To Christine, thank you for letting me muck up a beautiful painting. And table of contents. Okay, so, and on with the poetry. Hang in there. I lost 74 bucks at the track today, but I'm not in jail. A pane of glass shattered in the window, but I'm not in jail. Won't be able to buy groceries for two more days, but I'm not in jail. It's only 8 p.m. and I'm drinking the last of my wine, but I'm not in jail. My utilities paid apartment decided it's not utilities paid anymore, but I'm not in jail. The poetry isn't selling like it used to, but I'm not in jail. A lot of fucked up things, even worse, much worse than stated above, could happen to you. And as long as you can say, but I'm not in jail, after it, everything is going to be okay. Like the cat poster says, hang in there, baby. Full of fire. Laying in bed, almost asleep. It was dark. I heard her footsteps. They were coming quickly. Pat, 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 pat down the wood floor hallway. I opened my eyes just as her silhouette breached the doorway. The footsteps quit when she launched herself like a panther in the air towards the bed. I saw the blade in the moonlight as she was coming down. She landed in a straddle across my lap. That's when I felt that she was nude. I couldn't think about that, though, because the large kitchen knife was coming down towards me. I tried to stop her. We wrestled back and forth, but her strength was abnormal, superhuman. I couldn't get out from under her. Her hair was wild and beautiful. It flew like it was alive and separate from her, trying to get away from the madness that was taking place beneath it. She finally got the blade against my throat. I surrendered. I still couldn't see her face. She began to grind on me, rubbing her crotch against mine. I couldn't fight the arousal. I stiffened. With her free hand, she reached down and grabbed me, shoving me up inside her. 
She growled and moaned, grinding against me harder and faster. Her hair flipped back. That's when I saw her eyes. I would have been able to see them in complete darkness. They were full of fire and blazed with so much passion, such emotion, I completely gave myself over to her. I never had seen anything so beautiful before in my life. As the motion between us grew in speed, she grunted and screamed out. I heard the windows rattling, the walls shaking, the earth beneath us rumbling, the sky above us hissing, the pressure of the knife against my flesh was lessening. I grabbed her wrist and pushed against my throat harder, until I felt the skin beneath the blade give. I looked into her fire, leaned up against the knife until my mouth was on hers. Blood trickled down my neck, then poured down my torso. I opened my eyes and saw her staring through me with her flames. We came together at the same time. Extreme light broke the windows with the force showering us with glass, burning our skin. I heard the explosion outside. My eardrums burst, then I heard nothing. As we turned to dust, the last thing to go were the flames of her eyes burning into my soul then there was nothing the jacarandas have bloomed jacaranda flowers litter the sidewalk like roaches and bubblegum they have been blooming for weeks now but no scent none of that aroma from my childhood that makes me feel safe and secure none of that until today Today, faint whiffs, the smell in my nostrils, reminded me of better times, warmer days, less responsibility, dinner on the table at six, back when the wonder of women was something that kept you up at night, in naive astonishment, instead of them keeping you up because of the nightmares and cruel and hard faces and hearts. Money being something which meant you were able to play video games at the arcade, buy candy bars, ice cream, and soda pop. Being able to leave the liquor store with the comic book instead of having to put it back on the spinner rack. Now money is something that you never have enough of and is spent before you get it because all the bills and rent are late and the calls are getting more frequent. Some things shut off. All of these thoughts is my old dry feet, cracked and scaly like the dinosaur they're attached to, stomps around and flip-flops, smashing the delicate dying blooms under my rubber soles and soul, stained the cracked and uneven sidewalk that's already stained with bubblegum, dead roaches, piss and shit from human and dog. The sigh I just sighed was heavier than my 350 pounds of fat, bone, and shit, and I do not feel any better, but the jacarandas have bloomed and are starting to fill the air with that sweet smell that I have missed so much. All Jail Is All Jail Is is a place that breeds criminals. All jail is, is a place where people are trained to feel like a lower class citizen. All jail is, is a place to learn politics for the next time you are in jail. All jail is, is a place to punish people stupid enough to get caught without trying to make sure that they have the skills to never return. All jail is, is a way to make sure inmates will always fear men in uniform. All jail is, is target practice for those new recruits with their shiny new badges, so they will be brave in the sight of true fear. All jail is, is a joke, since once you get out, after paying your debt, you still have to pay for that debt, with a black mark on your name, for the rest of your life till you die. All jail is, is a place to go back to after you can't get a good job since that black mark won't fade and crime is the only answer. 
all jail is, is the home away from home for the people that society doesn't want in their neighborhoods. All jail is, is an archaic hierarchy that should have been abolished years and years ago. All jail is, is a repetitive cycle of producing more lifetime criminals. All jail is, is a repetitive cycle of producing more lifetime criminals. All jail is, is a repetitive cycle. All jail is. Just popping to buy to make sure you're doing okay. I had a dream last night where you were eaten alive by a tribe of midget cannibals that were awoken from stone. They ripped you apart in every direction. Little naked men and women with your flesh and organs hanging in their teeth. Most of them covered in your blood. The screams between your cries and their exaltations pierced my eardrums. But I'm glad to see that you're okay. Rumor. I heard a rumor today. A rumor that brought me to tears. Just the idea of the rumor would have done it. Just the faint grace of hoping it crossing my mind again made the water fall down my face. It's just the idea of one little thing being able to change the lives of everyone I know and most the people I don't. Just the hint of this rumor brought a kind of action to my thoughts. I swear that if this is true, I will do more, more than I did when I thought that this was a certainty, more than I ever could have done in the past. Please be true. Please, oh please be true. We need it. I need it. And all of us deserve it. And to the people that pull the strings, please do the thing you should have done the first time. My heart can't take the loss. My soul can't handle the injustice. My being can't handle the bullshit. If you fuck us again, Please, oh please, be true. Thoughts of Suicide When you have a great high, the next day, no matter how normal, can feel like the defeat of the ages. Last night, I felt this huge weight lift from my shoulders, creating ease on my weary bones. I felt good. I was happy. This morning, little things, minute things, normal things, mundane things pushed me to tears, blurring my vision, running down my cheeks, congregating in my beard. Anger, sadness, loss of what was no more from the night before I needed to run away. This could be a good plan if done correctly. I did not do this correctly. I headed down the mountain for a drive, being alone in a silent car with nothing to keep me company but my dark thoughts. This is when for only a fifth or a sixth time in my life, I've contemplated the big S, the ultimate form of masturbation. Suicide. This time was different. This time it didn't make me sad. I thought about my work, my family, my friends, how everyone would be better off with me gone. This time was easier to connect those dots. I would think that would have scared me a little, but it didn't. I would just hate to think that one of these people would have to find my body. That's never sat well with me. The only thing that has probably kept me from doing the thing. But now, here I was, alone, on a winding mountain highway. This would be the perfect time to do something this stupid. Just follow the skid marks of the fools that chose this way before me. None of these places looked good enough. Either the drop wasn't as big as I would have liked, 
or the railing seemed too strong. By the time I was over it, it didn't matter anymore because I was at the bottom of the mountain. What have I learned from this? Nothing. But I am a little worried about myself. In 301. Hadn't left the apartment in four days, going crazy, nothing happening, no life, none out the window, none within these walls. I killed all the roaches a couple days back. Everything, nothing, was out of food, was out of booze. Washed the grime off, put on the cleanest dirty clothes, went down the street. It was a nice day. Sun was out, not too hot, slight breeze, not too chilly, many attractive women in tight short things. No one hit me up for scratch. My card wasn't declined. It was a nice walk. The 5-0 was spinning cherries in front of my building. A cop stopped me. I told him I lived there, and he let me in. When I got off the elevator, there were cops and noise. It was a shit show. Blood everywhere. Sheets over two bodies. They didn't want me around, but I explained to them that I lived there. I pointed to my door, and after many minutes of questions, they let me inside. Turns out that I wasn't the only one going crazy with the dead mortuary lull of my building. Turns out the guy in 300 to my left side and the guy in 302 to my right side were leaving their apartments at the same time. One said something that the other didn't like. 300 pulled a gun. 302 got his head blown in half. Then 300 didn't want to come out when the cops showed up. 304 saw the immediate aftermath and locked herself in her apartment and called the cops. When 300 finally opened the door, he came out shooting, trying to make a run for it. Got plugged in front of my door, 301. 45 minutes isn't a very long time, but long enough for me to miss out on the only action this building has had in weeks. Bloody Mary Morning It is a Bloody Mary morning. I like celery, so I put two in. Even when I use mix, I still put in extra salt and pepper. You should listen to your body. It will tell you what you need. More salt or less salt. I also like to soak a few pieces of beef jerky at the bottom of the glass. Sometimes I put tahini in it. Sometimes A1. Sometimes beef bouillon. And I make it like a fucking stew. Throw some pearl onions in there. Some chopped bell peppers. French fries. Dip bacon. Sausage. Fried egg on the side. Other times, I feel like if I see food, I'll puke. So I just have the vodka and the juice. Cross my fingers and hope for the best. I saw my reflection in her steel butt plug with the large pink gem on the end of it. It was sitting on the sink. She had washed it after our last wild romp. Seeing my fat, naked body being more contorted like a funhouse mirror made me marvel at the fact that I could bed someone as beautiful and sexy as the woman whose rectum was penetrated by that piece of smooth steel. Seeing that jewel sparkle in the light between her cheeks when she's riding me makes me want to come all over again. I look into the bathroom mirror, this time not contorted, but confused, as I see what I am, as I see what she sees, the age, the gray, the lines in my face. I won't question it. I'll ride this one out with my achy knees and back until I can't go anymore, until she can see the fraud that I am. Alone among millions. I walk through this barren carcass of 1929, hearing the echoes of each step, spider webs of nature and ones of glass greet me along the way. The elevator 
inch deep with yellow water that smells just as bad as you expected to, just looking for someone to talk to. In a city of millions, I found myself alone for the upteenth time. I wait outside for pizza and beer. They finally show, then leave. Again into the pits of cadaverous concrete, looking for any voice, soul, presence. The heat beats me. The noise of people outside intrigue me. But when I approach, the party is over, and I stand alone, looking, waiting, anticipating, but nothing. Shower after shower to quench the boredom. Porn looks not so good. I go to the roof, eight stories up, see the people and cars like rats. No one up here but me. The sound travels up, car horns honking, couples arguing, sirens blaring. But the sun took a digger, it's cooling. My beer gives me chills finally, but I am still very much alone. Lightning. Some chick who wrote a pervy story, the poet in her story said, A poet is a man who runs naked out into a thunderstorm in hopes of being struck by lightning. Before that, Randall Jarrell said something along the lines of, A good poet is someone who manages, in a lifetime of standing out in thunderstorms, to be struck by lightning five or six times. A dozen or two dozen, and the poet is great. That was long-winded, clunky. Before that, Plato said some shit wasn't very good. The only thing that I know about myself after reading all this crap is... I am the lightning. I am the flash of light in a dark sky. I am the explosion of sound that breaks your eardrums. I am the spark that will burn a forest to the ground. I am the electricity that will fry your soul. Consider yourself lucky to be struck by me, to know me, to see me, to hear me, my words. They will light you up and hopefully you will no longer just be standing in a storm hoping against luck. Instead, you might be able to be the fucking storm. Curse of the Giants The strong, the independent ones, face a curse, known to very few. When they are vulnerable, they find themselves alone. When they are sick, they find themselves isolated. When they are crying out, there is usually no one there to hear. This makes us stronger. The solitude makes us learn to be powerful, to be the giants, to be the survivors, to be the ones to rule the masses who live every day as the dependents of other strong giants. I know you're not feeling good. One day I'll be there to let you feel weak, just for a little while, until you can be the strong giant once more. But today, you will have to know that this pain is making you stronger, more beautiful, more amazing, more powerful. Be small now. Be a giant tomorrow. <sighs> it's one of those nights where you know the cops are just a phone call away. When you know you've had enough. When you know you're going to break most of the dishes into the sink, onto the floor, maybe the trash can. When you know those assholes outside kicking whatever the fuck it is they are kicking are just another kick or two away from you going down there to kick their asses. When you know if that bitch upstairs doesn't shut up soon, you will go up there and break all of her dishes and kick her ass too. When you know that you'll wait in the hall, excited to know the landlord is coming because there's shit you've wanted to say to him for a while. 
when you know you're looking forward to shaving a haircut on the door because you want someone to take a swing at you so bad you get hard. When you know you'll suck on your gums until they bleed just so you can taste that blood on your tongue. When you know those people outside arguing are about to get shit hurled at them from your window and you've been lining up what heavy shit of yours you're gonna throw. When you know you'll be wearing metal bracelets by the end of the night. When you know they'll slam your head on the car roof trying to get you into that little plastic back seat. When you know, halfway through booking, that you overreacted. When you know, you won't see the judge until Monday, and it's Friday night, and that's a long time away. When you know, you won't have peace over the weekend. When you know, the noise that drove you mad in the first place will sound like angels singing compared to what you'll hear over the next 72 plus hours. When you know you'll have to go through all of that without smoke, without drink. When you know all you want back is that little square of madness that brought you here in the first place. When you know, when you know, when you know. My phone is never used as one anymore. Talking to people is disgusting to me. People are shit. They always have ulterior motives, so lies and deception is what comes into my ears. I use my phone for other things. I talk about pizza. Social media gives me ads for pizza. I talk about shoes. Social media gives me ads for shoes. I keep talking about blowjobs. I get ads for pizza and shoes. When my phone can blow me, I'll partake in society and technology. Looking for Abby. I don't know who you are or where you are, but I feel like I've known you for years because every time I text the word baby to someone, my fat thumbs and autocorrect get together and decide that I must be talking about someone named Abby. Ask and ye shall receive. I pass a sign on the freeway, a little sign, someone hung up on an overpass. The sign read, Ask Jesus for mercy. Then I said, Ask Jesus for money? Okay, Jay, I need some fucking cash. Stat, I'm driving on four bald tires. The gas bill is ten days late. I already missed the first post at the track. In fact, with this traffic, I'll be lucky to get there before the fourth. But please, for the love of God, if you're giving away the green stuff, lay it the fuck on me. Then I saw the sign again on another overpass. I wanted to apologize, but really, what was the use? A prison. I've been locked up in this cell for nearly eight years. It hasn't all been bad. The beginning was scary, but really good. And after a while, there were things that I didn't want to do, but did anyway, because that's what you do in a place like this. More and more doing things I knew I shouldn't be doing all along thinking maybe this will be it. Maybe things will get better, but they never do. My cell, my cage feels like it's shrinking a little more each day. Less room to move, less air to breathe. I've been transferred four times. They all had different cells, but they all shrunk down the same over time until I couldn't move at all. I would scream. That would bring judgment and punishment. Rage is not appreciated here. After eight years of this, I finally checked my pockets, and when my hand came out, I held a key. The sensation was strange, surreal. I placed the key in the keyhole of the door to my cell. 
turned the key. The door slowly swung open. I jumped back, then inched my way to the opening, barely sticking out my head. I looked to the left, I looked to the right, no one around. I took a step back, staring at this wide opening in the bars. I want to walk out, but knowing that I had the key this whole time makes this entire process quite strange. All I have to do is put one foot in front of the other. Crazy bitch. I place the two bottles of Sutter home on the counter with the tall three pack. Ask for my smokes. This old blonde bitch walked up behind me in line. Ew, gross. I hate that shit. Last time I drank that ghetto wine, I was sick for days. I couldn't really hear her because I had earbuds in, but I soon learned she was talking to me. She was fighting her mid-fifties with reckless abandon, biting and clawing her way back to her youth long gone. Her head seemed to bounce on a swivel, constant motion, like an inflatable air tube man. Large black sunglasses to hide this morning's hangover. A tight camouflage mini dress that didn't work because I could still see her. The man behind the counter asked if I wanted to bag. I did and thanked him for asking. The old bitch shouted out while constantly in motion. Yeah, give him the black bag so he can hide his ghetto wine from the neighbors on his walk of shame. The man said there was nothing wrong with the wine. I nodded. In fact, Sutter is pretty shit, but it has a high alcohol content, which makes up for it. I looked at her, and she stuck her tongue out, running the fat, dry, cracked muscle along her lips with white globs in the corners of her mouth. I headed for the door, and she screamed, Hey! Hey, boo! Hey, boo! Come back here! Boo! I'm talking to you. Turn around. I did, cocking my knee to give her a thrust kick right in the fupa. And she handed me my debit card. You left this in the thingy. I thanked her and got the fuck out of there. I miss L.A. L.A. has life and energy. Up here, up the mountain, where it's supposed to be quiet. If a dog barks, it puts you on edge. But L.A., there are so many noises. It's a symphony. All of the loud sounds. Motorcycles, big rigs, horns, stereos, gunshots, screams, sirens, ghetto birds, fights, even barking dogs. It's all a philharmonic. All of that noise is woven together to make a quilt of sound that envelops you. You can snuggle up in it, feel safe, warm. This audible onslaught is the pulse, the heartbeat of life, soul, violence, passion. It lives and breathes, procreates, more madness, more noise, more murder, more beatings, more death. LA is alive. It can't die. No matter how awful it will ever become, it will never die. that fucking fence it was fucking ugly 
tall, faded, warped wood, bottoms of it broken out from the monster dog that lived behind it. I hated that fence. One day, walking by, there was no monster trying to eat me alive. No barking horse dog with half its head underneath the broken planks, snapping jaws, foam and drool flying. It was gone. I figured it either died, fell asleep, caught a train, grew wings, teleported, or any number of things. This was the first time I stared at that fence, really looked at it, noticed how disgusting it was. Weeds growing up under it, halfway up the broken wood, cracks, knot holes, just an ugly gray, a goddamn splinter factory waiting for victims. I hated that fence. I kicked through one of the rotted planks. The snapping of the wood sounded good, felt good. I smiled. I couldn't remember when I smiled before that. I looked through the hole I made. The yard was overgrown too, waist high. Maybe the people who lived in the house were dead. Maybe they stopped feeding their horse and it was too stupid to find other things to eat. I grabbed a loose plank, pulled it off. That was good, but not as good as kicking. I kicked another plank. It split in half and my leg went through, making a long scrape up my shin. Blood trickled out. That was okay. Breaking the fence. Sounded good. Felt good. I took a step back and looked. The neighborhood was looking better already. I decided I would take the whole fucking fence down, come back and mow that grass, pull those weeds. This was great. The dog was dead. My ear was almost ripped off my head. I was pulled up on my tiptoes. What the fuck do you think you're doing? Some crazy old bitch with see-through skin and a fucking tracksuit and puffy paint designs was holding me up on my ear. What's it to you? You don't live here. This is my neighborhood. I won't have little scamps tearing it up. Bitch, let go of my ear. I kicked her shin and she was made of stone. I'm taking you to your mother. I know where you live. I'm making this neighborhood prettier. The fence is ugly. I hate it. It's not up to you. I wondered who it was up to. Nothing made sense. I was screaming and this old bag was stronger than anyone I'd ever known. When we got to my house, my screams from the driveway brought my mom out. Suddenly, all three of us were screaming. Five minutes later, none of us knew what the hell was happening. The old lady finally left. My mom asked me what happened. I pointed down another street to keep her from looking at the fence and said she just grabbed me. My mom said she would call the police on the old lady. I told her not to worry about it, that the old lady was obviously nuts. The whole rest of the summer, the fence was never fixed. I never heard the dog again. And by fall, we were out of the neighborhood. It may still be broken and ugly and shit. I hated that fence. And I don't think I ever felt as much joy as I did when I put my foot through it. Melvin. Melvin was on acid. Melvin was on shrooms. Melvin was on MDMA. Melvin had a great conversation with a potato. Melvin fell in love with the potato. Melvin took the potato in the bathroom. Melvin fucked himself with the potato. Melvin kept the potato on his nightstand. Melvin loved that potato. Melvin and that potato were in a relationship. I looked at that potato many times. I saw how Melvin looked at that potato many times. I no longer talk to Melvin.
about hangovers. When there is nothing you need to do or any kind of life or death situations ahead that day, hangovers aren't bad. A reminder of drinking to forget. You can try to piece together the stupid things you did the night before. Laugh, feel shame, etc. Get up, place your luck over a cup of Pam Greer. Smoke a cigarette, even though your throat feels like you have performed fellatio to a razor blade factory. It's all good. But if you have a court date, a job to be on time for, a funeral, a wedding... Even yours on both counts. A broken down car that needs a mechanic. An interview. A doctor's appointment. Yada yada yada. Adulting. Grown up life shit. That hangover isn't as pleasant or even fun anymore. Drink your lukewarm Pam. Puke it up. Try to face the day with the face of a warrior. Happy. I ran out of wine a few days ago, so one night, I just drank brandy. Didn't ever get drunk. Just felt like shit. The next night, I drank a half a bottle of vodka. Didn't really get drunk. Just felt like shit the next day. I smoked half a joint. That really made me feel like shit. I need wine to be a happy drunk. I grabbed a couple bottles tonight, drank them down. And seemed really happy, talking, jovial. Then I started to weep. I cried and I cried, missing things I could no longer get back. Things that I couldn't change. Things that were things. I'm not sure the wine makes me happy. A flock of seagulls. Sitting on the roof of my building, trying to get some sun and some poems down. A huge flock of seagulls swoop over my head, hundreds of them. Then just a half block away, they circle like a vortex, like a drain. They all come together, like a feather-filled tornado. Spin and spin, then go a couple blocks north, do it again. Each time getting higher and higher. There will always be some asshole bird late to the party, flying in like a maniac. But he gets there, joins the merry-go-round. I keep expecting them to dart to the ground, start digging through the trash or the insides of a corpse. But they don't. They just keep spinning, then flying off, just to spin again a couple blocks down. How do these creatures not run into each other? I can't walk down the street or the grocery store aisle without some dumbass crashing into me. These fucking birds, man, they spin at great speeds, never crashing into each other. And they have to be aware of things coming from all directions, not just left, right, or in front or behind, but up and down too, and diagonally. It's like a sphere of things that could go wrong, but never do. I keep watching them until the spots that float across my pupil are bigger than the goals. Then I turn from looking up and look down at this laptop and write this poem. Beautiful art. Went to an art exhibition today of an artist that I've admired for some years. I really wanted to see the piece of the four chicks, but they didn't have that one. But they had the can and some other cool shit. Walked around, and before I knew it, it was over. The pieces were quite small, and the whole thing could be taken in in just about 20 minutes. I stayed longer, hoping to get some wisdom imparted from a master. That didn't happen. I was a bit let down. Then walked out into the parking lot behind this chick with a fat ass that seemed to jiggle two seconds for every single step the chick took. It was the most beautiful piece of art I saw today. At the beach. The trash cans have assholes, but most have been turned. I can taste the salt on my lips. The water is 20 yards from me. 
There are women in every direction, all doing things, different things, a peeper's paradise, but none of them seem interesting. I drank too many overpriced Clamato beers, too many tacos, also overpriced. I feel sick, the opposite of what you should feel. Maybe it's the money I spent that's making me ill. There was a scary brown skeleton sitting in a small blue tent, staring into the sun. Not now, not today, I can't handle it. A fat white guy in a bedsheet with a boom box and a drum is on the pier, screaming about Hare Krishna. Someone gave this fool a microphone, or at least a permit. You would think with all the walking up and down the pier, never mind. It's the first really warm day of the year. Fat women are in bikinis, while other ones with good bodies know better. They'll keep till spring. They are covered up in leggings and long flowing tops. One walked by now, carrying a stuffed beaver. A little too on the nose for even me. They are shooting a movie on the pier, half of it closed. I don't give a fuck. The pier is for suckers. When did goth kids start wearing muted tans and browns? That's weird. The sun should be setting in a few minutes. The mist is coming up past the lifeguard tower now. The lifeguards are calling it early, heading back to base in their red trucks. $7 parking, $35 for supplies, $85 for lunch. Just because I was getting fucked around by ESP. Who's the dumb shit now? The giant pear. The pear-shaped woman gave pears a bad name. Biker shorts, a tight t-shirt. Words tried to tell me something, but they were so horrifically stretched, I had no way of knowing what the fuck it said. She had a small army of children. All girls, all loud, all with shit smeared on their faces, of varying ages. They bounced around her like caged monkeys being held by mom's gravitational pull. A woman was in line behind me. The pear gang was just standing next to me. Then the giant pear asked the woman behind me if she was in line. The woman answered affirmative. The giant pear shouted, That's just fucking perfect! As I was paying for my groceries, I heard the roaring black hole, which was the giant pear's mouth, making a racket. She was screaming at the woman behind me. I would never feed my kids baby food from a jar. Maybe a cat, but not my kids. I feed them myself. As she screamed, I noticed how fucking ugly her mouth was. The skin was all red around it like she went down on a hooker who hadn't shaved in six days. But there was acne, adult acne, just around her mouth like herpes, but with all different colored heads, some yellow, some orange, some white, some black. I wanted to vomit. I didn't want my groceries anymore. I couldn't imagine eating that stuff, but I already had paid. If what came out of the giant pear's gaping face hole wasn't so ugly, I would probably not be bothered by her ugly mouth. But you can't look past something when you can't hear past something. Plus, she was still hanging out with a musical troupe of animals just free from cages. I think if I ever have more kids... They will eat exclusively jarred baby food. DMV Trash My number was still 15 or so away. An hour had already passed. My senses were dulled until she walked up to the counter in front of me. Her hair was up and had grown out from a bad bleach job. Her face was cute, makeup looked good, trashy little, but good. Then the rest of her, she had on a tight white dress, no bra, nipples hard, trying to tear through the fabric. Her ass was huge, dress barely covered it. She dropped something, bent over. I was about three feet from her cunt, no panties, all hairy cunt and asshole. 
Her legs were just perfectly thick. Nice thighs went down to nice calves. And she had on white Converse, Chuck Taylors. I did a double take. They were stained. Stained with dried blood all over. She had to have been walking through it. Puddles of it. I slowly looked her back up. I noticed marks on her legs that I didn't see before. Dirt on her dress I didn't see before. Bruises on her arms I didn't see before. Scrapes on her face I didn't see before. I took a deep breath. She still looked good. I hoped she would drop something else. Booze. Let's talk about booze. There are different kinds of drunks that you could go on. They are all different, but they all hit the same place. At least once on any given night, if given all the opportunities of any other drunk. Case in point. You could go on a beer drunk and drink a shit ton of beer, piss a whole lot, feel like shit, burp, feel bloated, burp, piss a whole lot more, and take the stinkiest shit of your life in the morning before or after you puke up so much bile that you'll want to kill yourself. Or you can go on a liquor drunk, a hard liquor drunk. This is where you drink a pint or a fifth of hard shit vodka gin, rum, tequila, whiskey, scotch, etc. and get super blotto, super fast, and then realize it's only 7 p.m. and keep going like a fool because the night hasn't even started yet. Then by midnight, you're puking your guts out, wishing you were man enough to put the pistol in your mouth and strong enough to pull the trigger. Then there is a liqueur or cordial drunk. But if you're one of those, you're too stupid to be reading this in the first place. Finally, there's the only drunk that makes any sense. That's the wine drunk. See, the wine drunk is so nice and easy. It doesn't sneak up on you. It doesn't knock your ass out before the street lights come on. It's a nice, slow, mellow buzz that nudges you at first at the start of the evening. Then lulls you as you get stupid. Reminds you that you're a philosopher. Then lets you be silly again. Makes your head feel stuffed with cotton without having to take a piss every 20 minutes. You are still articulate, and then when you have a bottle or two swishing around in your belly, you can sleep a good 8 to 10 hours and feel fine when you wake. Now that you know this, know a couple rules. The drier, the better. You drink something too sweet, your shit will stink and your stomach will feel like rancid. Keep away from the bubbly. That makes you stupid and fast. That's when you act like you know everything, will fight anyone, and fuck anything with a hole, wet or dry. And since I know you're not eating, stick to red most of the year, and save the white for the summer months. Now you're sorted. Now you can become a professional writer alcoholic. Without destroying your liver, stomach, relationships, and sexual organs. You're welcome. My parts. We were in bed. She rolled over. Her arm came at my face. Pow! Ah! I shouted. Oh, I'm so sorry. Watch the money maker. What? You got me right in the sniffer. The what? My face, my nose. Why do you call everything something weird? Not weird. Okay, what do you call your esophagus? Throat tube. Your hand. Mic dropper. Your mouth. Face hole. Your feet. Wheels. Your fingers. Typers. Your teeth. A necessary evil. Your balls. Shit, balls is balls. Or nuts, I guess. And you're a poet. The best. What about your ass? That's my chair. We stared at the ceiling in the dark. Then I said, But it is strange that my chair makes stool. The walls were bleeding. 
giant red gashes slashes and splashes coming down dripping down at first it was just the dining room then the living room and bedroom i closed my eyes hoping it would go away when i opened them there was more redder than before this is why people don't wake up at 6 a.m or if they do they hate it I wonder how many bleeding walls there are across the country, across the world, at 6 a.m. I can't be the only one that sees them. The last three women I've lived with not counting the women who have stayed a day or two then split i mean the ones who wash these dishes every night these dishes pots pans cutlery at least three different sets of soapy hands i've seen watched with my own eyes rub with a soapy sponge the dishes know the pots and pans know everything in the sink knows i know but I don't know if they know. The first one wouldn't know because she was the first one with these, but the last two? Do they think about it? Each woman detests the one that came before, but do they realize they are washing the same sink of filth? Strange thoughts, half drunk on a Tuesday night, waiting on Friday like a kid waits for Christmas. The one thing I don't like about me being drunk is if I'm around people, I get stupid. I think so, at least. I turn into this strange creature that constantly wants to entertain and usually does. Everyone has a good time. But the next day, it isn't the hangover that kills me. It's my soul that has been chewed on, swallowed, digested by these people I'm around, making them laugh, scream, cuss, the whole thing. It depletes my fucking soul, my spirit, and I feel stupid, ashamed, guilty the morning after. Not because of any one thing done or said, or a multitude of the same, but just because I let myself do that. I let it happen. I let them make me the entertainment for their own amusement. The sad clown strikes again and will spend the next many weeks the way it should be, drinking alone, by myself, in a well-lit room, music on, laptop open, sharing these horrible tales to entertain you, the reader. Growing cocks. In December, they were so tiny and red. I didn't know what they were. Just smashed them with my finger. In January, they got a little bit bigger. Still red, but they got fast. Last night, I finally found one that was brown bigger than all the rest running the floor of my bathroom by april these fuckers will be so big that i'll go into the bathroom and a kafka-esque one will be sitting on the toilet reading the paper taking a shit and i'll apologize shut the door and let him finish spring cockroaches are always big loving me is a sickness it makes people do stupid things. They make horrible decisions. The last three long-term women I have had, all were doing pretty good before they met me. All making good money. All doing how they say, well. They end up with me, and they all want to be artists. They all throw away the things they had that made them secure, stable, and follow me down this track. It always starts off well for them. They make good money at first and think, why didn't I get into this racket before? It's so easy, they say. Then a couple months later, they're freaking out about money, about rent, about food, about booze, about smokes, about a job. 
Then they come to me for help, and I can't give them any because I barely make it. Every month is an adventure, never knowing where anything is coming from, how much of it there will be, and if it will ever come again. I don't know what to say, but I guess the best advice I can give is don't love me. A poet I know. I know this poet who tells me the story every time I talk to him about a reading he did with this other poet. This other poet is quite famous, someone to brag about, I guess. He always tells me the story, how he gave his reading, had nowhere to go or stay, and the famous poet asked the poet I know to come back to his place where they could party and chat. They did, and he stayed with the famous poet, and every time he goes to that part of the country, he stays with the famous poet. I realized, or found out, that this famous poet died almost 20 years ago. This poet I know has only been writing for about five years. I could talk shit about this, but I too talk quite frequently to dead people. They just usually come to mind. They never invite me anywhere. There is a very small drop of red wine slowly running down the bottle. I think about licking it off, maybe just touching it with my finger and putting it in my mouth. But if I do this thing, I'm pretty sure that'll make me a drunk. A no good boozer. But you see, I can't think of anything else. It's almost at the bottom of the bottle now. Maybe a centimeter until it reaches the table. Now even less. I'm sweating. What do I do? I guess it doesn't matter now. Writing that last bit, I missed it hitting the table. I guess I'm not a drunk. Silicone Thoughts While I was taking a piss, I was thinking, barely paying attention to what I was doing. I thought to myself, I wonder what life would be like if I got breast implants. The thought didn't stray after I thought it, like most thoughts do when they pass through my brain. This one stuck around like gum on the bottom of a shoe. How would my life be affected? Would I get farther? More friends? More admirers? More gigs? What would it be like? I wouldn't go for any tiny cups either. If I did this, it would be whole hog, giant, monstrous things. Would this be a good look for me? Would I be able to pull it off with the way I look and dress now? Would my ripped t-shirts even fit me anymore? Would I start an OnlyFans or a TikTok? What would be the point, the end game? Why would I do this thing? I hate going to the doctor. I'm terrified of surgery. I would be murder while healing. Maybe this is just a really bad fucking idea. I don't know anymore. I'm on my fifth or sixth vodka and water, and it's 11.47 p.m. I'm not tired, and if I was, how could one even sleep with thoughts of huge silicone titties bouncing around in their mind? I guess I could mull over the racing form again. There's a pick five at Parks and a pick six at Sam Houston tomorrow. Gotta get my head on straight. Some questions are better left unanswered. The Skydiver It was late. I had a day that I would rather never talk about again. The night, though, I don't mind talking about again. Because I have questions. Questions to think through. Questions to drink to. I was walking in the building with groceries too many bags to carry comfortably. I didn't know how would I get into the elevator with all this crap, but I saw someone holding the door for me. I rushed a bit to be polite, but then I saw that he was trying to pull the door shut, not hold it open for me. 
Shit, man, sorry, I thought you were holding the door for me. In a drunken slur, the man said, I was. I was confused. I didn't care to wait longer with all that crap. I stepped inside, and the man slurred. You gotta get away from the censor. He didn't need to tell me. I've lived in the building long enough to know how this shitty elevator worked. But then I realized I had never seen this man before. I looked at the buttons. He was going to seven. There are only three apartments on the seventh floor. He is not one of the people that live there. The only other thing on the seventh floor was the roof. He was drunk, holding a 40 ounce of malt liquor. His pants were hanging down right above his knees. He had a baby bottle in his back pocket. A full backpack on his back made moving in the elevator tricky. His baseball cap sat on top of his head, hanging down over his eyes. I pushed the three button for my floor. The door finally started to close. The slowest elevator in Los Angeles made its way up. I'm going skydiving, man, he said with his eyes closed. Nice. Yeah, man, I'm going to the roof to jump off. No shit. Yeah, man. We stood in silence. The elevator finally stopped at the third floor. The door opened. I tried to squeeze through with all my bags without looking back. I said, Take it easy, man. I'll see you on the other side, he chuckled. Sure, man. He mumbled some more shit, and then the elevator door shut. He was still mumbling as the elevator was pulled up the shaft. When I got in my room, I put everything down, then put everything away, poured a glass of wine, lit a cigarette, fell back on the couch. I couldn't stop thinking about the jumper that was on the roof. I kept looking out the window, thinking I would see him pass. Time ticked by, and no body dropped by my window. People who want to kill themselves usually don't tell you they're going to do it. People who talk about it are usually looking for someone to talk them out of it, or just have someone to talk to. They need a friend. I didn't feel like making friends tonight. I drank until I passed out. Then in the morning, after doing my bathroom business, I checked all the windows. There was no splattered human on the sidewalk below. That made my conscience feel better. After thinking about it for a while, I thought about what is one's duty or responsibility when someone tells you that they're going to kill themselves. I really don't think it's my place to stop someone if that's what they want to do. If I wanted to kill myself, I wouldn't want someone to stop me. There are too many people here anyway. If one wants to make a little room, that's a very selfless thing. Now, if it was my kid that wanted to kill themselves, I would hope someone would stop them. But after thinking about it, I understand that I wouldn't want my kid to live out of my own selfishness, my own need for my kid to love and prosper. So the question that lands on my lap, who the hell am I? Who the hell am I to say anything, to get involved? Who made me the god of this, the decider of who lives and dies? But who is the government to say who should live, who should die? I don't want my kid to die. I am weak. I am selfish. My love for my child is selfish. I do not love the drunk on the roof. So, if he wants to go skydiving, knock yourself out, bro. I'll see you on the other side. The Hamsters The hamsters are having sex again, she said. We were in a town that was too narrow for a man like me. The room was too small, the bed too small, the shower too small, the water too soft, the bed too hard, the walls too thin. The night before, actually just a few hours before, the couple next door were fucking, if you can call that fucking. The bed in the next room spoke modestly, squeak eek, squeak eek. It went on not too long, but too long for that sound, 
They made almost no sound themselves, the hamsters. He cleared his throat once. She squeaked in a slightly lower tone than the mattress. She did this just once. Then the squeak sped up just slightly, and then it was done. No climax, no crescendo. It just stopped. At 9 a.m., they started again. Just as slow, just as loud. I had never heard sex that made me feel less turned on. Usually, if I hear fuckers fucking in the next room, mine ends up in a boxer in my hand. Hearing the hamsters fuck made me want coffee and earplugs. If you fuck, fuck good. Fuck like you mean it. Fuck like there are people listening in the next room. There usually is. On the outskirts of Palm Springs. I awoke on a strange sofa, surrounded by others in various stages of unconsciousness. My mouth was dry, felt like a fresh tampon. I was coughing and gagging, so I looked for a cigarette, fondling myself, praying that there was at least one left. Found one and lit it coughed. I saw a young man standing across the room. There you are, he said. He was looking at me, then sat down next to me, began talking. I wasn't listening because I thought for sure he was talking to someone else, but he was talking to me. Who the fuck was this guy? He said, I've decided to do it. I bit. What have you decided to do? The thing we talked about last night. You know, the thing. What the fuck was he talking about? He continued. Since I was little, I've wanted to get rid of it, and now I think I'll do it. Get rid of what? My dick. Your dick? Yeah, I hate it. I've always hated it. I want it gone. I'm going to see a doctor and get it chopped off. Chopped off? Yes, it's disgusting and ugly. I hate it. Dicks look like dicks. Not mine. Mine is gross. Let's see it. I've seen lots of cocks. I'll let you know if it's ugly. He sighed in disgust, flopped his arms down, stood up, and whipped the fucker out. Just hanging there like a lucky rabbit's foot. I said, that looks like a normal cock. No, it's awful and dirty and gross. That's what all dicks look like. No, mine is worse. You suck dick, right? Of course. Do you think the dicks you suck are disgusting? No, I think they are beautiful. I blew out some smoke and said, Well, if you do it, I don't think there's any turning back. It's a forever thing. No, it's not. It's going to shrivel up and turn black and fall off anyway. I let that hang. Looked for a drink. Couldn't find one. Didn't think I could get up without vomiting. This guy really thought his cock was going to shrivel up and fall off. Sometimes you can't reason with a person. Some beliefs people have are so deep and ingrained that there is nothing you can say to change their mind. I just need to figure out how I got there, but more importantly, I guess, how the fuck I was going to get gone. Pissing with a familiar stranger. I looked into the mirror in the bathroom. Yes, I had been drinking, but that isn't the point. What is, however, is that I was there, looking at myself, examining my body, my face, my hair, etc. My arms are smaller than they once were. My stomach is a little smaller, but not by much. My pecs are bigger, that's a plus I guess, and my chest doesn't have that dad bod look that my arms seem to take. There's so much gray in my beard and on my head, some say it looks distinguished, I'm not sure. My skin looks older, but not in a bad way, I don't think. I don't look like a roasted chicken. I don't look like an old leather belt. 
Not yet, anyway. As I was noticing all of these things, making notes, mental and otherwise, I needed a piss and realized that I had never pissed in this sink. Have I pissed in other sinks? I couldn't remember. Maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe it's something I've done multiple times. I looked down, and I was in fact naked. I pulled up my sack and dropped it on the sink, dick hanging over, and let the yellow water flow. It was a great massive stream. Splatter occurred. The sink began filling rather quickly. I glanced over to the toilet that was only a foot away. Panic started. Would the sink fill? How do sinks work? Can they handle urine? Who's in charge here? I looked up at the mirror and saw some strange man looking back at me. His smile frightened me. I gasped. The man gasped. I realized it was me. We both laughed. I stopped pissing, pulled my cock and balls off the sink, watched the last of the yellow go down the drain, turned on the faucet, let it run a bit, splashed it around. I looked again to the familiar stranger. Till we meet again, I said. Yeah, someday when you look older and I look older, he said. Still naked, I turned, walked back to the kitchen to refill my wine. The floor. I live inside my head most of the time, but so much so that I rarely notice things that happen around me. Sometimes days go by before I realize that I haven't changed my shirt or done the dishes or taken out the trash. This sounds bad, but I'm really not a bad housekeeper. But just now I looked at the floor and found cigarette wrappers and butts and empty wine boxes and empty wine bottles and empty grocery bags and empty fast food bags socks hairballs pens racing forms blankets backpacks string paper pages out of books pages out of my books bubble wrap a broken bowl a condom wrapper a ukulele shirts shoes well, I guess those should be there. Empty boxes, a pillow, a business card, a piece of popcorn, one of my paintings, no, two of my paintings, shampoo, and the fucking dryer sheet that I slipped on the other day when I fell over and ate shit crashing onto my desk, then the floor, the dirty, dirty floor. <sighs> this sounds like I am not that great of a housekeeper, considering this is all in a studio apartment. You are friends. B can only come from anal. C can only come when getting DP'd. J hustles a racket out of the subway. D likes the smell of corn. F is a junkie and a compulsive liar. M only fucks strippers. P is hung up on F, and F is hung up on another P. R raped F. P complains to N about it. T hates Pisces men and is ugly. E married for health insurance. S tries to fuck everyone. W tried to fuck you. G and A want to get pregnant. I'm glad we don't hang out with your friends. All emo. What the fuck is this? What? This poem. It says, she rode me till she cried. What the fuck is that? What do you mean? Why was I crying? I don't know, you were just crying. Like all emotional? I guess, I don't know, just crying. That makes me sound all weird. Why the hell would I be crying? Shit, I don't know, I didn't even realize you were. It wasn't until we were in the shower afterward that you told me you were. Oh, you mean you fucked me until I cried? Like I came until I cried? I don't fucking know. Well, that's okay then. I just don't want to come across that I'm some emotional wreck. I don't think anyone would ever even know it's you. As long as I don't sound all emo. I walked into the kitchen and thought that I should probably stop writing about people I fuck. The Condemned My Nostalgia 
Mine is different than most. Some people look back on nostalgia with eyes of gold. It reminds them of times that were good. Mine, on the other hand, makes me think of times that were better. Not that things aren't good now, but there's a difference in life before and after childhood's end. When I look back on my childhood, I can look down and see my baby fat arms, free of tattoos and scars. I can see every piece of rock and rubble that is in the concrete of my driveway. I see every blade of grass and weed. Now I see my aged skin, a driveway, and a lawn. The amount of wonder inside the head of a child is superb. Adults and adulthood beat that away until you're just like everyone else. The ones who try to hold on to that are the ones that have trouble, can't cope, arrested development. I think that in some way, adults have children so that they can live vicariously through their children, so they can try to see the world through eyes like that again, try to regain that sense of wonder, astonishment, but in doing this, they are condemning their child to lose that thing that made them special in the first place. You are condemning a child to eventual adulthood, the rat race. You are condemning them to be you. Sunday is just a few days away, and Sunday is Mother's Day. I'm supposed to celebrate my mother on Sunday. But how am I supposed to celebrate someone who's condemned me to this life? But I'm sure I'll bite my tongue, take her flowers, smile and nod, hug goodbye. I just hope in June, when my child's birthday comes, and Father's Day comes the day after, that my child doesn't see the world as I see it. Now that my child is an adult, doing adult things, that my child doesn't blame me for their existence, but is happy to be along for the horrible ride. Loser. Losing is awful. It is the bottom. It is the despair. It is everything that you would never want, but the only thing that is unavoidable. I don't mean to sound harsh or negative, but the probability of losing is much greater than winning. In a horse race, many horses lose. Only one wins. In a game of football, basketball, baseball, hockey, soccer, the odds can start at 50-50, but at the end of the season, there is only one winner and many losers. Losing is inevitable. Winning can happen, but it will with less frequency. It has to. A winner will eventually lose, but a loser may never win. But you won't ever find out if you are a loser or a winner unless you play. I never read Garcia Lorca. I don't think I've ever read a poem by Garcia Lorca. I know about the firing squad, the dirt road, the drinking fountain. I know all of these stories. I found a poetry collection that has a poem from Garcia Lorca in it. Today is the last day that I can say that I don't think I ever read Garcia Lorca. The Obelisk She had a headache. Screams bounced off the walls. Cries echoed through the small apartment. Tears raced down her cheeks. While she sat on the couch, she put her arms around my waist as I stood before her. My shirt was soaked in salty pain. I can do nothing but stand there. I laid my hand on her head to comfort her. She screamed. Nothing I did help. Nothing but standing there. I was a monolith. I was an obelisk. That was my job. That's all that was needed. But I felt like a failure. Who the fuck is that guy? I took a horrible shit in the beach restroom. There was piss all over the floor. I could hear people shitting in the other stalls. 
I knew this was a homeless guy's studio apartment. I tried to be nice, but I was barefoot and sure I was catching something ugly. I gave up. After finally getting in a miraculous position, apparently the effort was too much for my asshole. I stormed back across the sand to where I left my woman. There were suddenly people around. When I had left, it was desolate. Now, there were two guys throwing a football, a couple of chicks in the surf, some dude with a camera, a dude with a bike, and some soon-to-be-dead douchebag vaping standing five feet from my chick staring a hole through her body. I was already mad because of my asshole, but I saw this fuck standing there the whole way over. I was huffing and puffing. I shouted, Who the fuck is that guy? She looked up at me. What guy? The guy with the bike? No, that guy. I pointed right at him, and he was already jogging away down the beach. She didn't even notice him. Then said, That's nice. You scared everyone off. I looked up, and sure as shit, they were all gone. The two guys at the football, the two chicks in the surf, the dude with the camera, the dude with the bike, the douchebag... We had a nice rest of the day, even got ice cream. Hello, neighbor. I was having a hard time bringing stuff through the door in the lobby. I was wearing pajama pants, slippers, dirty tank top. There was too much. I was dragging it through. The door was heavy. I was bent over, legs spread. I knew my pants had fallen down. I felt the cool air on the back of my balls. No underwear. I knew my asshole would be winking at anyone in the lobby. I hoped no one was there. Then I heard, Well, hello, neighbor. It was this younger black gay dude from the first floor. He didn't help with the door. Just watch the show. I see him all the time, and he says, Remember that day you were trying to bring all those groceries in at once through the door in the lobby? I tell him I do. He smiles and shakes his head. I'm popular. 50. Most writers aren't considered great, I guess, until they are 50. I don't understand the logic, but maybe it's because once you hit 50... You stop caring about pleasing people. You just do. You just are. You are comfortable in your creativity and your ability. You aren't trying to make it anymore. You've made it. Or as close as you think you're going to get. And are happy to just be creating. I only have six years to wait. (sighs) Broken Pipes An inch and a half of scalding hot water was all over the floor in my apartment at 11.30 on a Sunday night. The guy upstairs died in the bathroom while running the tub. The fire department came, broke down the door, turned off his water, somehow broke a pipe, turned off the water at the street, and took the old carcass out of here. It's been 16 hours, no water except on the floor. And I hadn't shit since drinking a case of Bud. I couldn't hold it. Lifted the lid, saw the empty dry bowl, and made a mountain of mud. It was so high I couldn't get to wipe without sticking my hand in it. The smell was awful, just like this poem. I couldn't flush it. It just sat there like it sat in my intestines, letting me know of its presence. When the water finally came back on, I flushed, and it didn't want to leave me. I felt sad for that mass of shit. It wanted to stay. I said, you have to go. I flushed again. It hung on for dear life. I didn't want to put my foot on its head, but what choice did I have? I flushed it for a third time and was finally rid of that stinking shit just in time for my landlord to turn the water off yet again. Drinking Problem I guess I have a drinking problem, tonight anyway, because there is no booze in the house. It's safe to say that I've had a drink, or several, every night for at least the last two years, maybe three. I took six months off before that, maybe 
every night for four years or six. I don't like to drink with people. They are annoying, and I am too charming. I either get the wrong person horny and get the wrong person mad, or some other shit happens that causes other shit later. I prefer to drink alone, either with a good book or some music or both, or with me typing hard and fast and stupid. If I don't drink, like tonight, my head gets too loud, too crazy, too many thoughts, too much thinking, wrestling over my attention and my brain space, and I end up having to scream, shut the fuck up, while slamming my fists against my head like I did 20 minutes ago and like I did just now. I'm trying to write a poem, can you please just shut the fuck up? If my knee wasn't swollen the size of my ex's tits, I would have walked down the stupid fucking hill and got a couple bottles, but I can barely walk now. And after that trek, my knee is always worse, that it takes two or three bottles just to put me to sleep to fight another day. Just five hours till morning. I can trick someone into going for me then. Men watch porn. Men watch porn. Dudes fucking chicks. Men watch porn. Wet snatches slammed. Men watch porn. Cocks disappearing, reappearing, repeatedly, quickly, from behind, from the side, from underneath. Balls slamming assholes, balls slamming clits, throbbing cocks in hand, spurting white on skin. Men watch porn, seeing more cocks than cunts. The sight of cocks now make men hard. Pavlov's dog drooling on cock. Men watch porn, straight porn, gay porn, cock hungry, confused they are gay. Just suck a dick if you want to suck a dick. Get your ass fucked if you want your ass fucked. Don't worry about what label you fear to wear. You don't have to wear shit. Enjoy your sex. It's your business. Only yours. Emotionally promiscuous. He wants the laundry done, his house clean, the animals cared for, food on the table. He doesn't like to talk about her feelings. That's too deep. Her wants, too deep. Her desires, too deep. He won't fuck until he wants it. He won't eat pussy because it's icky. He won't read her poetry because it's not his thing. So, she gets validated from other men online. Other men who pick up the emotional slack her husband left. They become her sounding board, her romance, her whipping post, emotionally, her everything. Her religion, her God, and her man tell her that this is the life that she deserves, that there is no way out. She can't afford to leave three hots in a cot. When it's pointed out, she makes excuses for him, then finally talks about how she really is happy, sometimes. And years from now, she will read this poem, angry that I broke her trust and shared her sin but will also realize that she's still in the same situation, that nothing has changed except the growing number of emotional boyfriends she has had over the decade, and hopefully then she will have the courage to fucking do something to fix it. Boyle. The size of a baseball, inner thigh, painful to walk, to stand, to sit, to shit, days on end, constantly growing, moving towards sentience. Woke up this morning, blanket glued to my leg, my crotch, the boil vomited its soul all over the white sheets, the green blanket, my disgusting skin, then over hours of slumber, dried, stuck, fabric to flesh. Tried to rip it off like a band-aid. Pain rushed. Skin was so tender. My own blood trying to kill me. My own body rejecting. My own blood. Pus fighting myself. Me fighting with my blanket. I won the battle. Lost the war. 
standing in the shower, running hot water down my sore skin. My baseball, now a golf ball, is still there. This ain't over. I don't answer. There's a knock at the door. I don't answer. The phone rings. I don't answer. Emails come in. I don't answer. Text messages bing. I don't answer. Comments accrue. I don't answer. People scream outside. I don't answer. Don't these people understand? I'm fucking terrified. Leave me alone in my cave, in my solitude, in my misery, in hopes that it turns to peace. A metaphor of my life. I sit at a large table that I sit at every night. I make cigarettes here. I eat food here. I drink wine here. I watch YouTube here. I listen to podcasts here. I look out the window at insanity here. This table that is so large is so full of crap that I only have but a small area to do anything at. The table itself is filled with paints, cups of water, old racing forms, notebooks, cords, wires, wine glasses from nights way gone, empty bottles, full ashtrays, giant bags of tobacco, boxes of tubes, boxes that once held tubes, my cigarette roller, and a couple smokes worth of shake, so many other things too. That only gives me a few inches to work with every day. I sigh at the clogging of my table. I am drunk. A bottle of cheap red. I want to go to bed. I get up, almost fall down because of the pain. My left foot has some plantar illness. My right knee, some patella malady. I hobble into the shitter. Watch a black spot run across the wall. Spider, cockroach, fly, mosquito, I don't know. I can't properly see even with my glasses, especially when I'm this intoxicated. I smash the bug with my fist, then hold my fist close to my eye, trying to make out the gooey smash on my knuckles. I can't, so I wipe it off with TP and toss it into the dark yellow piss. That scares me because I know it should be clearer which means I should drink more water instead of just coffee and red wine. I stumble back to my bed, stop by my desk, which has a little more room than the large table, type this out, and I hope I can make it to my bed without falling on my face. The Desk Lamp's Revenge In the late afternoon, at my desk to write, flip the switch on my desk lamp. And out shone from the bulb, complete and utter darkness, horribly opaque, no light in it at all. The black beam sounded as if it were crushing the things beneath it. I ran my fingers through it, feeling great pain. I pulled my hand back, grabbed the lamp, swung its beam around the room, creaking, breaking, smashing, shattering, sounds breaking silence. The wine gnats and flies flew away in a flurry, hurriedly, my dirty cum-crusted clothes on the floor inched like caterpillars towards the safety of the setting sun. My paintings taped to the walls pulled away from their adhesive, rolled tight from the destruction. Everything was failing, everything was falling apart. I finally shined its full blackness onto myself. And soon I was compacted, crunched into the vacuum, the absence of light, and became nothing more than a mere idea, a faint memory of something that once was, possibly at some point, somewhere, filled with purpose unfulfilled. Special thanks to those who made this project possible. J.H. Caitlin Stryker, Bunny Wild, Shaylin Marks, Deborah Kurtz, Chase Delaney, Mindy Simmonson, Thomas Crop, Tim Johnston, Brian Bruce, Tamara Albana, Jeff Taylor, Adam Crawford, Matthew Buckley Smith. Thanks, guys. www.ihatematwall.com, www.poeticanarchy.com.